Hey, it's Zedrin again, here with one more tutorial, this time about file objects and tweening. This tutorial is going to be a bit different than the last ones, as file objects and tweens are more tools than part of the animation process itself. As a result, you won't use them in every single animation you do, but they can be useful for some specific applications. To start with tweening, if you have an animation where a single part stays mostly constant but it moves around on the screen, tweening is great for this. For example, an arrow flying through the air or a bouncing ball. You can turn any layer, object, or animation folder into a tweened animation by clicking Enable Keyframes on the timeline. When this is enabled, you cannot interact with the element anymore to draw on it, but using the Object tool allows you to move it around and reposition it and scale it and things like that. Doing so will make a diamond on the timeline called a keyframe. By default, there are three types of keyframes you can make, selected from this drop-down option. Yellow is a hold interpolation. This will maintain the current position and values until they finally get changed. Green is a linear interpolation. These will transform the values of keyframe A into those of keyframe B at a constant rate over the timeline. Blue is a smooth interpolation, which also moves between frames A and B, however it also applies easing between them to try and give it a more organic interpolation. Easing is a very important animation concept, and there's more ways to control it than just this. If you want more fine control over the motion, you can open up the graph editor with this button here. These will display various values over time. These values include the position, rotation, scale, center point, and opacity of your object. You can toggle which properties are visible at any given time to clear up your timeline. You can even change which coordinates are visible. The X and Y coordinates are relevant to scale, center point, and position, which would use vectors, while velocity is relevant for single coordinate values such as opacity and rotation. All of these properties are affected whenever you make a keyframe. While well, in smooth interpolation mode, you will also notice these little Bezier nodes coming off of each keyframe. This allows you to fine-tune the easing of a frame. To go with a classic example, if you wanted to make a bouncing ball, you'd only have movement going up and down, so I'd make keyframes at the top and bottom points, hiding the X value. However, we also want it to decelerate as it reaches the top and accelerate downwards faster and faster until it hits the ground. So, we want the easing for Y at the top of the curve to be flat, and we want it to be as steep as possible for the base, both at the starting and ending we would want the ball to bounce right back up and wouldn't want it to ease when it's striking the ground. If we wanted to add some squash and stretch, we can also adjust the scale at certain points. If doing this, I would recommend changing the center of rotation to the bottom of the ball, just to ensure that it properly contacts with the ground and that scaling doesn't change its position overall. Keyframes can also be applied to entire animation folders, which affects the whole animation folder, not just individual cells. You can use this to move an animation around as it plays out, rather than having to redraw each frame in a new position. Do know that when you do this, you cannot add additional frames or edit them. However, you can always turn off keyframing to do so, and then turn it back on and your values will be saved. CSP also has something known as file objects, which have a wide number of uses, even for animation. Any .clip file can be imported into another document as a file object. You can also right-click any selected layers and go to File Object, Convert Layer to File Object. This will allow you to make one on the spot and choose the location to save it. For this tutorial, I'm going to refer to the main document as the composition or the parent file, whereas the file objects will be considered children. File objects cannot be edited in any way in the composition that they're present in, as this just references another file on your computer. However, you can open a file object and still edit it there and when you save the changes, they will carry over to the new document, or documents if you're using it in multiple different files. It's important that you don't change where the file is saved on your computer, as CSP is going to look for that specific location each time it calls the file object. In the main composition, the file object can still be moved around using the object tool, transformed using the transform operation, etc. But since it's just referring to the document, it's actually not altering the original and not making any edits. This means that there's also minimal quality loss, which is actually very useful for a few other applications. For example, one popular use for file objects is to make decorative walls and then use perspective scaling to sort of assemble a three-dimensional looking wall. For animation, you can also use this to make what's called nested animation, as well as rudimentary puppet rigs. File objects can contain anything that CSP can normally handle. So for instance, if your file object has an animation folder on its own, it will actually play out when imported into a new document if there's a timeline present. Do note that for this to work, you have to actually import the file object into the document. You can't do this from a created file object from the layer panel. If you've already created a file object from the layer panel in this matter, simply just re-import it. 
you can use this to make slightly more complex animations and composite them together. This is a process known as nesting animation. For instance, I've made a little egg dude wearing a top hat and a monocle walking across the screen. This little egg is actually an animation file object himself. Importing him into the document will just cause his animation to play out in place. I can then tween it from side to side to make him walk across this background. I also need to make sure when doing this that the file object has the same length as the composition I imported into, so I may need to extend and loop the animation. One quick tip that I should have probably mentioned earlier in this tutorial series is when you have a selection on your timeline for the timings, you can hold down Alt and Drag to make a duplication of these timings. This technique makes making loops very easy to do. As I mentioned earlier, keyframes can also apply to an entire animation folder, so I could have just animated this in the main timeline itself. However, if I have a lot of components to the animation, nesting it in a file object can help a lot with organization. Mr. Egg Dude was only one animation folder, but if he had a total of like four or five animation folders as part of him, nesting him would make my timeline much cleaner. So for example, if we imported Hero from the previous tutorials into a new file object, we wouldn't have to deal with all the extra layers that we had there. If we wanted to edit those, we could go back to the original, but on the new composite, we only have to deal with that one layer of Hero. This can also be useful if you have multiple characters on screen, especially if they're not physically interacting with one another. It's also important to note that file objects will display all layers, even invisible ones. In order to prevent sketch layers and stuff from showing up from the file objects themselves, you need to go into the file objects and set the sketches to draft layer. You can do that in the layer panel next to the lock layer and reference layer buttons. One other interesting quirk with animated file objects is that if you put them inside an animation folder and sync them to the timeline, you can actually control which frame is currently displayed via the Tool Properties panel when you have the object tool selected. Additionally, if you click New Cell, this will make a copy of the file object and will give it a spot on the timeline. Normally, the displayed frame is fixed for the entirety of the timeline, so using the New Cell button can allow you to display a bunch of different cells and different frames of the child animation. There are a few cases where this might actually be fairly useful, such as with puppet rigging and stuff, so it doesn't hurt to know how to do this. It would be super nice if we could just keyframe these values, but that may come in an update in the future, who knows. Otherwise, this about covers everything that I have to teach on animating in Clip Studio Paint. Additionally, I want to stress that while I use EX myself, you don't need EX to start animating in CSP. You can easily get started in Pro, and everything that I've taught so far all applies to both. Sometimes it feels like I'm only just scratching the surface of what Clip Studio Paint is able to do. Anyway, I hope you found this entire series very helpful, and that it's gotten you started with animating in CSP. If you're interested, feel free to check out some of my own work as well.